So as one does, I got on the telephone and, and started making the calls. And when I first spoke to, to Tony and, and outlined exactly what the uh, framework is about, he actually readily agreed to speak. And then, like I said, this is very humbling for me because, because somebody of, of this is Canada, uh, this is a, for me, this is a, a major coup and a, a major step forward for the games industry to engage with the film industry. So rather than me rambling on a whole lot more, I'd like to introduce you to the President of the Screen Producers Association of Australia, Mr. Anthony Kinnane. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, what a lovely lunch that was, and I thank the organisers of this event for being so uh, so generous in uh, endeavouring to take what may be the first of, I hope, uh, many little steps uh, to perhaps work towards a more of an integration of the uh, of the film and television industry in Australia and the uh, and the games industry. Uh, as Tony said, uh, my name is Tony Ganane, and I'm the uh, president of the Screen Producers Association of Australia. And um, the first thing that hit me when Tony asked me to speak at this event, when I once I started to think about uh, my industry and your industry was how many similarities there seem to be between the two of us, and yet curiously, also, both in, in history and process and practice, uh, have what, quite a lot of differences, what, what, what a lot of um, differences seem to presently exist. And when I did a little bit more research about this event, part of the reason why I was pleased to speak at it was this, I think, interdisciplinary analysis uh, is terribly important and I think that we need to work harder to learn from each other and to apply uh, lessons that we've learned from our individual businesses to each other's businesses. Perhaps I'll begin by telling you a little bit about, for those of you who are too young to be aware of it, the way in which the Australian feature film industry in its present form came into existence because, in point of fact, it predates the uh, emergence of the games industry by almost 20 years. It was in 1970 that the Gordon Liberal government, following lobbying by a group of uh, arts activists, set up a number of institutions to foster and uh, create a new Australian film industry. These entities, names of which may be familiar to some of you, included the Australian Film Development Corporation, which was a merchant bank for financing feature films, the Experimental Film and Television Fund, and the Film and Television School. And just goes to show what you could buy in 1970, the, addition, the initial appropriation of the AFDC, the Feature Film Funding Merchant Bank, was a big $1 million. There was a tariff board inquiry in 1973 and a new Labor government under Whitlam came into power. And when that happened, the Experimental Film Fund, the Australia Council's film activities, and that merchant bank, the AFDC, were all merged into an, an organisation called the Australian Film Commission, which became the peak film industry body throughout the 80s. Now, I think it's important to note to, in terms of drawing a comparison between film and, and games is that our film industry, the new Australian film industry, did not come into existence because a group of producers sat around and discussed the economics of commercial film investment and successively lobbied government for support based on that basis. Rather what happened was that a collection of arts lobbyists and some writer-directors plugged the support argument into a cultural agenda that at the time was keen to build an Australian identity in the arts and to break the then prevailing ties with the UK, cultural ties with the UK, and to a lesser extent with the United States. So the support we got in the 70s came enveloped in regulations governing significant Australian content and a variety of other restrictions that impaneled and embedded a mindset into the film industry that was sometimes profoundly non-commercial and sometimes militantly anti-US in attitude. Many Australian filmmakers of the 70s and the 80s 
were determined to shoehorn Australian audiences into examinations of Australian history and subcultural lifestyles which had neither mainstream nor export value. Now, not all filmmakers took that path, and Hexagon and Tim, Bur uh, Tim, uh, Tim Burstall, with films like Alvin Purple Peterson or Eliza Fraser, or myself with films like Patrick and Harlequin, did try to make content that would entertain audiences worldwide. But as I say, that was to some degree a minority. What we were able to do, though, over 40 years, thankfully, was to keep the federal government's support for our industry largely bipartisan. And we have been generally able to resist playing off the left or the right of the political spectrum, one against the other. So this has ensured an ongoing measure of continuous support, continuous government support for the film industry, with well over a billion dollars of subsidy deployed to it by a variety of measures ranging from direct subsidy in the 1970s through tax shelter in the 1980s, back to direct subsidy in the 90s and much of the last decade. And the support mechanism for the film industry recently reverted back to a tax-based structure via the producer offset in the last 18 months. Now, some commentators argue that this continued support for the film industry, continued government support, has encouraged us to fail to accept commercial responsibility for our output. And it is indeed that support that is responsible for the comparative lack of success of our industry over the years, hiding, as it often does, behind the mantra of the alleged worldwide domination of the film industry by the Americans. Certainly, recent re-evaluation of our business and what needs to be done to take it from a cottage industry to a series of sustainable businesses is fortunately focused on both commercial and cultural goals. Apart from the producer offset, we have seen the introduction of the location rebate to encourage large-scale uh, international films like uh, Knowing or uh, Ghost Rider uh, to shoot in Australia. And, the, and also we have now the uh, PDV, the uh, post-production digital, digital video rebate for post-production. And neither the location rebate nor the PDV rebate are based on Australian content. They're based on Australian spend, spend in Australia. Now, your industry, on the other hand, was initially driven by individual developers working to develop their own IP and then gradually combining those activities with fee-based service work for the big international game publishers. You guys have never had, except in the broadest and most populous sense of the word, I suppose, a cultural agenda per se. With almost no government support and without content restrictions, some startup companies in your industry, like Beam, were sufficiently attractive to be acquired by international entities like Infograms. Others quickly began to provide price-effective content for Sony, Vivendi, Universal, and EA. When the new Australian cinema re-emerged in Australia, film was already 70 years old. And apart from the changeovers from silent to sound, from black and white to colour, and from academy aspect to the various widescreen scope permutations, Film has been relatively and traditionally slow to embrace technological change. On the other hand, the games industry, from its beginnings, has had to embrace change and deal with many of the issues film still has to fully rationalise. Issues like uh, the solo game player versus the uh, MMOG experience mirror the debate about watching films in a cinema with an audience versus watching them at home on a TV, PC or console. Film interactivity is, 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 is basically straightforward and simply ranges from special features on DVDs to 3D cinema releases. And despite the obvious advantages of digital exhibition, and in most cases production, the changeover of cinema exhibition from 35mm to digital has been hampered and delayed by financial and other impediments.